Good morning, everyone. I'm Oliver Kim. I'm the incoming director of health policy here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, while I may be new to BPC, I'm not new to today's issue of Medicare sustainability. I spent a decade working for two members of the Senate Finance Committee and as deputy staff director for Senate AG. Um, and for, I'm sure many of you, ensuring the sustainability of Medicare has a personal element as well. My dad turns 90 in a couple of weeks, and he's one of the nearly 64 million Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, BPC has also been a lead voice on the issue of Medicare solvency. Last year, BPC released the report, The Cost of Waiting, about the options on solvency. And uh, we'll drop a link uh, to that report in the chat so that you can view it at your leisure. Um, we're also doing a number of other projects to find efficiencies, both in Medicare and the healthcare system at large. For instance, next week, we'll be having a webinar on improving behavioral health. Um, but turning to the issue at hand, the trustees report came out last Thursday, and I'm guessing most of us uh, just flipped through it to see the date of the hospital insurance trust fund and when that would be exhausted. Uh, the trustees report now puts that date at 2028 two years later than last year's report. Uh, so are, why aren't we taking a sigh of relief? Uh, well, because as BPC's report last year stated, there is a real cost to waiting. Today's webinar will walk through the trustees report as well as the policy and political considerations if we wait longer. Uh, we're pleased to be supported in this work by Arnold Ventures. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to recognize Erica Socker, the Vice President of Health uh, care payer reform at Arnold Ventures. Uh, she's held positions with the White House Office of Management and Budget and Congressional Budget Office in Brookings. Uh, Erica, if you'd like to say a few words. Sure, thank you so much, Oliver, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as Oliver mentioned, we're here to talk about the fiscal challenges facing the Medicare program, and really importantly, what policymakers can do to address them. So in many ways, the, the trustees report that came out last week highlighted what we already know, which is that Medicare spending is growing rapidly across the program and placing an increasingly large burden on beneficiaries and on the federal budget. One reason for Medicare spending growth is demographic. The baby boomer generation is aging into Medicare as they turn 65, and that's increasing the number of beneficiaries that are covered by the program. This trend is expected to continue for the next decade or so. But the other issue is rising healthcare costs, which is not an issue that's limited to the Medicare program, but affects the healthcare programs more broadly. And this means that in addition to having more beneficiaries, the Medicare program is also having to pay more over time for each person that is enrolled in the program. One of the most cl closely watched projections, as Oliver mentioned, um, is the insolvency date of the hospital insurance trust fund. The hospital insurance trust fund pays for Part A benefits. So this is hospital and post-acute care services. And it's pr funded primarily through payroll taxes that workers pay. This year's report projects that the hospital insurance trust fund will now be, in will be depleted by 2028, as Oliver mentioned. And what this means is that, that at this point, the Medicare program will not have enough money to fully reimburse for the Part A claims that are submitted. 2028 is an improvement over last year when the insolvency date was projected to be 2026. It's tempting to interpret this as good news. We have gained two extra years. But however, in that time, the calendar has also, the calendar has also advanced a year. Policymakers haven't really gained much additional time to act, and solvency is still only six years away. And just to put this in context, since 1990, we previously only come within six years of insolvency five times. That's five years over more than four decades. And while the hospital insurance trust fund is what many people focus on, the program's fiscal challenges are not limited to Part A. Looking beyond Part A, the picture is still pretty bleak. By law, the Supplemental Medical Insurance Trust Fund, which pays, that's because it's funded by general revenues and beneficiary premiums, which are adjusted each year to cover expected spending. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any problems here. Spending is projected to grow substantially in Medicare Part B, which covers physician and outpatient services, and Medicare Part D, which covers prescription drugs. 
This means the beneficiaries will pay higher premiums and that more and more general revenue will be required over time to fund the program, placing a greater strain on the federal budget. The trustees report is our reminder that the Medicare program faces serious fiscal challenges. So the question then is what policymakers can and will do about it. There are two fundamental options available. We can spend less or we can raise additional revenue to pay for the program. Addressing the program's fiscal issues will likely require some mix of the two given the size of the shortfalls the program is facing. And this is what we've often seen happen in the past. Enacting reforms to Medicare is politically challenging. Congress and the president have been reluctant so far to take on this issue. It will involve making trade-offs and ultimately taking money out of the system in certain places or making some people, whether it's workers or current beneficiaries, pay more. But the problem is also not going away. And just to emphasize one thing that Oliver said in the beginning, which is that addressing the issue will only get harder and more costly if policymakers wait to act. As the insolvency data of the trust fund gets closer, the set of options available to policymakers becomes more limited. Um, it, it, it means that addressing the shortfall will require more difficult and more potentially disruptive changes. Today, you'll hear more from the panelists about what the trustees report said and what a poten potential path to addressing the program's fiscal issues could look like. Before we dive in, I just wanna take a moment to thank the BPC team for putting together this event, um, including for assembling such a great set of panelists and for your ongoing work on this important issue. We're excited to be partnering with you on this. And with that, I'll turn it back to Oliver to introduce the first panelist. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Erica. We really appreciate that. And we look forward to continuing our partnership. Um, so today's webinar will have two parts. And just a reminder, if you have a question, you can tweet them to hashtag VPC live or enter them into the chat. We'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so let's start with the first part of our program, which will be an in-depth review of the 2022 trustees report to help us understand more than just the HI trust funds depletion date. We're so pleased today to be joined by Corey Cello, an actuary and the senior health fellow at the American Academy of Actuaries. Uh, she serves as the actuarial profession's chief policy liaison on healthcare issues. And in this role, she promotes the formulation of sound health policy by providing nonpartisan technical assistance to policymakers and regulators. Um, I will turn it now over to Corey. Uh, why don't you walk us through the latest trustees report and what are the high points and what it means for Medicare, both the trust fund um, and the program at large. Great, thank you, Oliver. And thank you, Erica, for the great setups to my presentation. Can you get the slides up? Thank you. So let's start. Oops. Let's start with some high level information that comes from the trustees report that was just released last week. And a lot of this was already discussed uh, by Erica and Oliver. So Medicare enrollment in 2021 was nearly 64 million people. There are 55 and a half million in beneficiaries age 65 and older, and over 8 million younger than 65 who are eligible through disability or ESRD status. Total spending um, for Medicare in 2021 was $839 million. And that comes to about 20% of total national health expenditures. Total Medicare income last year was $888 billion. So that seems like a pretty wide gap, um, but that was actually the difference between income and spending last year is actually larger than usual. And that's because spending was lower than anticipated. And through the report, we see that the program faces three fundamental financing challenges. First is that income to the HI trust fund isn't enough to fund the full benefits under, uh, the, uh, under the HI uh, benefits. Increases in SMI costs continue to put pressure on beneficiary household budgets and the federal budget and increases in total Medicare spending threaten the program's sustainability. 
So I want to just, Erica touched on this, but I want to go into it a little more. So there are two main or two uh, Medicare trust funds. The first is the hospital insurance or HI trust fund, and that covers inpatient hospital as well as post-acute care. And that's typically referred to as part A. And it's financed primarily through payroll taxes. The other trust fund is the supplementary medical insurance or SMI trust fund. And that covers physician and outpatient care through Medicare Part B, as well as the Part D prescription drug program. And it's funded through beneficiary premiums, which make up about a quarter of the revenues to SMI, as well as general tax revenues, which make up the remaining three quarters of revenues. Now, Medicare Advantage does not have its own trust fund. Instead, it covers benefits from both Part A and Part B and it's financed through both the HI and the SMI trust fund. So hospital costs that are incurred from Medicare Advantage plans are paid for through payroll taxes, and the Part B type benefits are funded through beneficiary premiums and general tax revenues. And the reason that it's important to understand this is that Medicare Advantage enrollment has been increasing rapidly. In 2010, about 25% of Medicare beneficiaries enrolled in private plans, and the vast majority of these plans were Medicare Advantage plans. This year increased to 40% in 2020, and by 2030, over half of Medicare beneficiaries are expected to be in private plans. And both speakers before me have already noted this, that the expected trust fund depletion date in this year's report, 2028 is two years later than projected last year. In addition, the HI deficit, which is the difference between the income and the cost, is projected to be slightly improved. Last year, the deficit was 0.77% of payroll, and this year it's projected to be 0.7% of taxable payroll. So why did this change happen? Why is this improvement going on? Well, the Medicare trustees put together a nice little table that details the components of the change. And I wanna focus on two of these. The first is the change in assumptions regarding the private health plans. So what the trustees did was improve the methodology for allocating the Medicare Advantage spending between parts A and part B. And that resulted in lower Part A spending, which therefore improved the HI trust fund. The other difference big, that I wanna highlight is with respect to the other economic and demographic assumptions. This was um, mostly an increase in projected payroll taxes. The, with the lower in, uh, unemployment and higher wages, taxable payroll is expected to increase and with that an increase in payroll tax revenue. So that's the difference between last year's report and this year's. But as Erica mentioned, we have to think about what's driving the, the financial challenges of the program overall. And as she mentioned, there are two of them. The first is the demographic drivers. The number of HI beneficiaries is rising. And at the same time, the number of workers per beneficiary is shrinking. So in other words, there are fewer workers paying into the program that, are, that is funding the benefits for the beneficiaries. Also, as Erica mentioned, there, there's a health spending growth component to this. Um, and the way we, we can look at this is looking at per enrollee expenditures for both the HI and the SMI program and compare that to per capita GDP growth. And over the next few decades, the growth in per enrollee expenditures exceeds that of GDP. So that's another driver of, of Medicare and how it's growing faster than the economy. So it's both the number of beneficiaries as well as the growth per beneficiary. So we talk about this trust fund depletion date, but what, what, what does it mean? So it doesn't mean that the trust fund is just going to go completely bankrupt and there will never be money in there again to, to pay for benefits. What, what it means that in 2028, tax revenues will still be coming in, but it won't cover full benefits under the HI program. 
HI revenues will cover only 90% of expected expenditures. And as I mentioned, that deficit over the next 75 years is 0.7% of taxable payroll. Eliminating that deficit would require an immediate 24% increase in payroll taxes or an immediate 15% reduction in benefits or some combination of the two. And that's just what would be needed if we acted today. Putting things off would require more severe changes. Now, looking out 75 years is kind of tough to wrap your head around, I know. So I think it's also important to look at like the near-term shortfall. So the cumulative shortfall from 2022 to 2031 is approximately a quarter of a trillion dollars. And what will happen when the trust fund is depleted and the, the money coming in isn't enough to pay the expenditures? Well, payments to HI providers, that's the hospitals, post-acute care and hospice providers, would need to be delayed until the money, more money comes in so that there's money to pay out those providers or be cut on a proactive, I mean, um, uh, pro-rata basis. Um, we don't know exactly how this will happen. It's never happened before, and we hope it won't happen in the future, um, but there is some, some uncertainty about exactly what will happen. And there are ripple effects that would likely happen. Wages and employment of nurses and other hospital and post-acute care workers could be affected. And ultimately, beneficiaries could face reduced access to care. If hospitals are getting less money, they may be less willing to um, treat uh, Medicare beneficiaries. In addition, Payments to Medicare Advantage plans would need to be delayed or cut. As I mentioned, the Medicare Advantage program the plans get part of their funding through the HI trust fund. So if there's not enough money in that trust fund, there wouldn't be enough money to pay those MA plans in full. It's unclear how this would affect MA plans and how that would affect their payments to providers, the beneficiary access to care, extra benefits, um, provider networks, all those things could be affected. So time is of the essence. As Erica said, even though we've gotten two extra years, um, that's still we still need to be started now. Uh, the more imminent the trust fund depletion date, the fewer options that are available to address the problem. Structural changes to Medicare can take several years to implement. Um, details would need to be worked out and implemented, and also beneficiaries and other stakeholders would need time to make adjustments of their own. Even straightforward changes to provider payments or Medicare Advantage plans um, can take two years to enact and implement. And we might not even have those six years. The trustees go out of their way this year to highlight the uncertainty in this year's projections. They note that the uncertain paths of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economy are contributing to unusually large, uh, an unusually large degree of uncertainty with these projections. So while this year the trust fund improved by a couple of years, depending on the economy, it could actually go the other way next year. Okay, so we all focus on that trust fund depletion date but the trust uh, trustees report is hundreds of pages, has thousands of numbers. We focused on one, I'm guilty of it as well, but we do need to think of the other, um, other solvency and financial issues regarding the program. And we need to uh, think about the SMI trust fund as well. So the SMI trust fund will remain solvent, solvent but that's only because its financing is reset each year to meet projected future costs. And projected increases in those expenditures are going to require increases in both beneficiary premiums and general revenue contributions. So for example, premiums and cost sharing for parts B and D um, exceed a quarter of the average social security benefit. By 2040, they are expected to reach 35%. And this doesn't include any cost sharing for part A services. In addition, this has been the fifth consecutive year of a Medicare funding warning. I'm gonna oversimplify this, but in general, it means uh, this is triggered when the difference between Medicare outlays and dedicated revenue sources 
is projected to exceed 45%. So in other words, general revenues are funding more than 45% of the program. So in general, it, when this um, warning is triggered, the president is instructed to submit proposed legislation to Congress. But as Jim Capretta pointed out in a health affairs forefront blog yesterday, um, even though this warning has been triggered often over the past couple decades, the last time a president submitted a legislative proposal was back in 2008. And finally, we, we need to recognize that Medicare sustainability challenges go beyond financial solvency issues. We need to think about whether the program is meeting the needs of beneficiaries. So the traditional Medicare program in terms of its benefit coverage does not coordinate the Part A and Part B cautionary requirements. It does not cover things such as vision, dental, hearing, and long-term care. And it does not cap out-of-pocket services, I mean, out-of-pocket costs. The Medicare Advantage program does, is required to have an out-of-pocket cost limit and can coordinate uh, cost sharing and can cover extra benefits, but the traditional program does not. In addition, we need to think about whether and how the program affects racial and ethnic disparities. The Medicare program has a great opportunity here to be a leader in addressing health equity, improving health equity, and reducing health, I mean, racial and ethnic disparities. So to sum up, the policies, um, Medicare policies should aim to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries have access to high quality health care that's affordable both to them and to the nation as a whole. And as I'll add, I'll add is also um, pays providers fairly. So I'll throw it back to you, Oliver. Thank you, Corey. That was a really great foundation for our discussion. Um, if you have a moment, could you touch on, uh, you talked about some of the uncertainties in the trustees report. We did have a question from the audience about um, the effect of COVID. Does the trustees report uh, reflect on some of these, you know, volatile economic factors, not only, you know, the pandemic, but we're also uh, feeling a lot of effects of inflation. Um, are those some of the uncertainties that the trustees mentioned? Yeah, so absolutely. COVID is still um, creating a lot of uncertainty. The trustees in their report, they estimate or they project that the effects of COVID on direct costs as well as deferred care will phase out over the next couple of years. One thing they've also mentioned is the mortality effect on, and of COVID and how beneficiaries who passed away because of COVID were more likely to have higher health care costs. And so that's left the remaining beneficiaries with lower um, expected health costs. And the trustees ex are incorporating that into their projections, but expect that effect to phase out by 2028. So those are just, but you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know um, if and when the next waves will be, how severe they will be, um, and that kind of thing. And on the other side, uh, questions regarding inflation, employment, wages, all those kinds of things do contribute to uncertainty. Great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Um, this was a great foundation for the next part of our, our discussion. Thanks, Oliver. Um, so now I'd like to bring forward our panel, uh, which will discuss the policy and political issues from the trustees report. Um, I'll, I'll introduce them uh, alphabetically um, and then kick it off with an opening uh, question for everyone. Uh, so first we have uh, James Capretta, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and also a senior advisor to BPC. Earlier in his career, he held senior positions at the Office of Management and Budget and on the staff of the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, Juliet Kamansky is the Deputy Director of the Program on Medicare Policy at Kaiser Family Foundation, where she has been conducting research and analysis on Medicare since 2004. Uh, Dr. Kavansky leads analysis on various aspects of Medicare, including spending, financing, and the financial burden among 
Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, next, we have Chris Jennings, who is a senior advisor with BPC and a three decades long health policy veteran of the White House, Congress, and the private sector. Uh, he served as deputy assistant to the president on health policy and the coordinator of health reform in the Obama White House and in a similar capacity in the Clinton White House. And finally, we have Dean Rosen. He is a partner at Melman, Castanetti, Rosen, and Thomas. Uh, prior to joining the firm, uh, he held a series of high level positions in both the private sector and government, including on key committees in both the Senate and the House, as well as with one of BPC's senior fellows, uh, Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. Um, so since a lot of you have congressional experience, why don't we start this out like a committee hearing? Uh, what is your opening statement? What would you say to our audience? Um, is, is your impression of the uh, trustees report and, and also the sparse coverage of what happened? Um, how can we get uh, you know, policymakers to focus on this issue? Um, why don't we start with uh, Jim? Well, thank you, Oliver, and thank you to uh, BPC for holding this session. I think it's terribly important. Um, to your question, how can we get the Congress and policymakers to focus in on this? I'd say a couple of things. One is that um, the uh, even though the report says that the HI trust fund uh, may be depleted two years later, I think there's a general recognition in Congress, at least there should be, that there's so much volatility now in our economic indicators, anything can happen. And so they really ought to be thinking ahead to what if things go worse than the trustees are even projecting, which is a real possibility. And you know, you could end up with a report next year suddenly saying things are moving back in the other direction because of the economy, you know, uh, various disruptions from the global environment. Uh, any number of different things could happen. We go into a recession you know, payroll taxes could fall quite dramatically in a short period of time. So they really need to be prepared and thinking about how to make Medicare more resilient and can and something that can be sustained, as everyone has already been saying, through thick and thin, so to speak, so that it can be, you know, there, you know, no matter what. Um, one last point on that is that, you um, Medicare needs to be matched with, uh, I think I agree with everyone sort of pushing in the same general direction here, which is matched with revenue that could be sustained over a long period of time. Uh, and that includes for both parts of Medicare, both the HI trust fund and SMI. They both need to be sustainable financially for taxpayers. And that's uh, demonstrably really not the case at the moment. And so a lot of work needs to be done and uh, it needs to be done on a bipartisan basis because the challenge is so big, it's, it's too much of a lift probably for either party on its own. Great. Julia? Sure. Um, my thanks as well um, to you, Oliver, and everyone at BPC for um, organizing this briefing. Um, and I have to agree with Jim that obviously this is a really important topic and um, great that we're focusing on it this morning. Um, I would say, you know, that the uh, depletion date of the Part A trust fund is the number that really gets the most attention when the trustees report comes out each year. But in a way, it's unfortunate that we don't pay more attention to some of the other um, spending trends that the trustees flag for us. Um, each year in the report. And I know, you know, 200 plus pages is a lot to get through, but, um, you know, they are really providing us with a great public service in terms of flagging, um, you know, financial concerns related to the Medicare program as a whole. So while we all kind of obsess over the depletion date of the HI trust fund, I think some of that obsession is a little um, misplaced or at least misguided in detracting from our ability to focus on some of the other important spending trends. And I think Corey did a great job of highlighting some of them, um, including the fact that we're now spending more as a share of total Part B, uh, sorry, total Medicare spending on Part B, physician services and outpatient services, than we are on Part 
A and Medicare Advantage spending is also growing as a share of total Medicare spending. Those are really important spending trends and they have important implications um, for the financial challenges that the Medicare program faces. And so just focusing on the Part A trust fund solvency date or depletion date um, doesn't really help us when it comes to understanding the bigger picture of Medicare spending and Medicare spending trends. Great, thank you. Uh, Chris, your opening thoughts? Sure. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about potential interventions later, but uh, I, I I find myself agreeing with everyone, of course. Um, I've been around so long that I remember the last time that we actually engaged in a bipartisan effort to do something on extending the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, which is in the mid-90s. And if you look back to the mid-90s, that was the last time that we had the same number of a short number of years to insolvency for the Medicare program. And I, I guess the hope out of the Bipartisan Policy Center is that that will at least signal that even if this is, has been extended for two years, we're still at the shortest period of time towards insolvency as we've been since the mid 90s and have been so consistently for the last four years. So it's something, it's, this should be a little bit of a wake up call. I guess I'd like to just make a couple of observations about the report itself. Um, one, of course, is that we have a significantly increasing number of Medicare beneficiaries coming into the program, which should not be, so therefore it shouldn't be shocking that we are going to have some financing challenges facing the program. The second issue uh, that the report does underscore is that we have fewer people paying into the program. And that also means that we have to think about how we reorient financing. We're also overpaying some providers and plans. We're also seeing that over half of the Medicare beneficiaries that enroll in Part A and B are enrolling in the MA program, the Medicare Advantage program, which is costing us more than if they had been enrolled in the fee-for-service program. So we, again, we have to at least look at that. Um, we also have to acknowledge, uh, as Corey did, that uh, beneficiaries are exposed to an increasing amount of out-of-pocket costs and are starting to convey concerns about that. And lastly, um, again, what Juliet and Corey and Jim have said, this is not just a Part A system uh, challenge. This, uh, it's not a hospital insurance issue only. It is a B challenge. It is a Part C challenge. It is a Part D challenge. And so we need to talk about all these things as we formulate interventions, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. So I'll turn it back to you, Oliver. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, Dean, your opening thoughts. Thanks, Oliver. And thanks so much for um, including me in this panel. Um, I guess first, like Chris, I was <clears throat> around uh, back in the uh, old days too, when it was the last bipartisan effort to try to really um, address this. But I think the point that Chris made is is really salient here, which is that the the warning um, uh, lights that are that are running across the dashboard that Corey so eloquently uh, talked about today are very similar now, I think, to what they were in the 1990s when <clears throat> when policymakers had to act. Um, a couple observations and then a couple of thoughts to frame this for me. One, um, you asked Oliver why, um, you know, what could be done to get more attention. As you all know, all of us who've served in government, uh, Congress and, and the administration in many ways are sometimes just a, what I call a just-in-time uh, institution. Uh, like uh, my kids with their homework, sometimes they wait till the very last minute. Uh, what we learned with COVID is that sometimes just in time, and uh, we saw this with supply chains and other things, we're now feeling the effect of it with inflation and other things. Sometimes just in time doesn't work that well. Uh, and so uh, we need to prepare. I think Jim's point on volatility is a critical one. Uh, I, I think for two reasons, the next couple of reports are to me likely to look a lot worse than this. Uh, not only in terms of year depleted or year uh, we start to go out of balance, but <clears throat> in, in other aspects too. One is that the volatility is to me all moving in the wrong direction. We see this with the uncertainty in international affairs and the effect it's having on our domestic economy. Two is that 
uh, you know, as Corey talked about, the assumptions in this report are just looking out. I, I noted that even though the report came out in June, the assumptions that were based on numbers uh, locked down in February. Um, but as you look ahead, um, almost every provider and plan stakeholder wants to be paid more by Medicare, not less by Medicare. And I think Congress is going to be, uh, you know, looking at being responsive to that in the near term. So I would say for me to sort of frame it with those observations, um, a couple of important things I think as we look ahead and as Chris said, I know we'll get into specifics maybe in a little bit, but one, I think it's important to look comprehensively at the program, even though the reporting and the press reports are around part A, this is really about a structural a program that's not structurally sound comprehensively into the future. I think policymakers need to look at solutions that are comprehensive. Um, to uh, improvements that um, <clears throat> that some of the panelists talked about here, um, looking forward and that are needed, and, and and Julie touched on this. I think when you when you look at improving and expanding Medicare, as some policymakers want to do, those need to be balanced uh, with the need to look at these trust fund issues. We can't just have our dessert; we've got to have some uh, some spinach too. Um, and, and I would say the last point on volatility is that we don't only have volatility in um, our stakeholder community, in our healthcare system, particularly coming out of COVID in our global financial circumstances, but we have political volatility now too. I'll end on this point, Chris, which is very different than we had in the 1990s. Um, we've come out of two decades where we are about to have our 10th election, that's a change election, here in 2022 out of the last 12. So the House or the presidency or the Senate or all three have switched um, more times than not, in fact, 10 times out of 12. And when you look at the report itself, um, you know, no, no private trustees, four of the trustees are current government folks. Um, it's a very transient um, uh, system that we have, even in terms of flagging these warnings. So I'd like to see some reforms themselves finally in how this report is is put together, how this report is used. And I think that will help to lead to um, more folks being invested in the solution. So I'll, I'll conclude with that, Oliver. Great, thanks so much. I mean, all of you have talked about the need for structural reform and uh, both Chris and Dean referred to uh, the last major budget event, um, the 1997 BBA, um, that did address a lot of solvency issues. It also had a lot of good policy that, you know, improved things for beneficiaries, had other health program effects. Um, you know, we think about this as making difficult choices, but what are some structural interventions? What are some good things that, you know, could make this more palatable? Uh, you know, uh, for example, Jim and Juliet, you've both written um, about how uh, Medicare is based on a 1960s model. How, how could you make it look more like the insurance system does today? Um, I'll throw it open to whoever wants to start. Well, I'll, I'll jump in just to kind of get it going. Uh, look, I mean, I think you're right, right on the right track there, Oliver, with your question, which is that there, there's opportunity here if, if people are creative. I mean, obviously there's pressure coming from various quarters to expand the Medicare benefit. And why is that? Well, because it, you know, in a certain sense, it is inadequately designed. You know, it was designed a long time ago, and it's gonna, you know, been updated with, with various patches here and there, but it hasn't really systematically been updated. And you have a very irrational cost-sharing structure that leads people to buy Medigap. Um, there's catastrophic protection in Medicare Advantage, but not in fee-for-service directly. So there's some irrationality to it, you know, and cost sharing makes sense, you know, when people are in a fee-for-service environment using outpatient ambulatory services just as a, a way of participating and not overusing the system. But it doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of inpatient services where someone is being checked into a hospital at the at a physician's direction. So I, I think they need to redesign and rethink the whole structure of the benefit. And therein lies an opportunity. You could add some things to it and give some better protection to the beneficiaries, but it has to be done in a way where there's more efficiencies, 
There's better competition between fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage. It's a little bit more level playing field so that people can take advantage of finding cost savings from more uh, lower cost ways of getting services. Um, the truth is that Medicare Advantage is be being paid more than fee-for-service. That's been mentioned a couple of times, and of course it is true. It's been shown in lots of reports over the years. But that's not to say that Medicare Advantage doesn't, in most cases, cost less as an efficiency matter than fee-for-service. There's lots of excess costs in fee-for-service too. And so we need to think about how to get this whole system kind of uh, focused on delivering higher value for what's being spent. And uh, you know, I do think there's opportunity there if it's done right. I have to agree with Jim um, on many of the points that he just made. Um, primarily the the fact that you know the Medicare program today um, presents beneficiaries with gaps um, in coverage and relatively high cost sharing requirements, which means they either need to purchase supplemental coverage or you know for many beneficiaries, the choice of enrolling in Medicare Advantage now seems quite appealing since, many of these plans offer um, extra benefits and are available for no additional premium beyond the Part B premium. So, you know, we've we've kind of ended up with a program that seems to be tilted more in favor of Medicare Advantage. And as Jim just noted, we're paying more per enrollee in Medicare Advantage than if that person was enrolled in traditional fee-for-service Medicare. If we want a more sustainable Medicare program moving forward, and we want to continue to offer beneficiaries the choice between traditional Medicare and Medicare private plans, I think steps need to be taken in order to level the playing field in terms of that choice from a Medicare beneficiary perspective. So improving the benefits that are available through traditional Medicare, but also from a, from a program payment perspective, leveling the the payment playing field um, between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. This, this system is not sustainable if moving forward we continue to pay plans more um, than, um, than if a person was enrolled in, in traditional Medicare. So I think those issues need to be addressed. Unfortunately, you know, we haven't seen a lot of appetite among policymakers on either side of the aisle for um, talking about the need to, to change the way we're paying Medicare Advantage plans. Um, you know, policymakers haven't really paid that much attention to recommendations from the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which, you know, is tasked with giving Congress recommendations on Medicare provider payments. So I think, um, you know, moving forward, it would be helpful to have a serious discussion about Medicare Advantage payments and a serious discussion about the need to um, improve the Medicare benefit package for beneficiaries today. And I'll just jump in and let and then hand it off to Dean. But I I, I would say that um, one thing we really have to do is it's been years and years and years since we've even appointed uh, the bipartisan trustees uh, to uh, to advise the administration and the Congress uh, on about, about some more specific ideas, or at least to provide some additional technical assistance and context that might help. It would also send just a signal that both sides care about this issue. And I know all of us on this panel think that that's important. I, I do want to say something about aligning MA and uh, fee-for-service. Somehow, whether we address overpayments or we align the benefits and the payments a little bit more rationally, we, 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 we do need to do that. And uh, yes, we are uh, indirectly subsidizing higher um, and better benefits in the MA program. Um, and so the question is, do we align that for the fee-for-service program and how best to do that? Also, I think we need to empower the Medicare program to be a better purchaser. Um, and and we, frequently we don't do that. Um, and that's going to be necessary. We also need to look at overpayments in general, not just MA, but post-acute care and a host of other areas that we have seen documented abuses in 
that MedPAC continually and consistently makes recommendations to address. Um, and lastly, we are fooling ourselves if we think we can do any of this in a meaningful way to sustain the trust fund without some significant new revenues. Um, that's just the reality. It's really just math. Uh, there are proposals. Uh, they don't have to be payroll taxes. They can be other revenues, particularly to closing some loopholes in some of the high income payments that some high income people are paying and others are not. Um, and directly in dedicating those revenues to the trust fund would extend the life of the trust fund. But this goes back to my point is if you're going to have a lot more per capita, you're going to have a lot more beneficiaries coming to the program, no matter how efficient you are in terms of your payments, you're going to have to find some new revenues. And, uh, and yes, I'm a Democrat and I say that, and sometimes Republicans don't acknowledge that because they want to put that on the table at the end. But I want to just mention to our listeners that both sides recognize that it's going to have to include both revenues and payment reforms. Uh, and, and lastly, I do want to say one last thing, uh, which, which deals with longer term issues. And the point I was making about how many fewer people we have paying into the Medicare program. Over time, we're going to need to support families to care for children and to have more children, frankly, in this country. And if not, we're going to have to be talking about immigration reform, too. Because if we're going to have this many older people in this country, they're going to be requiring care, and we're going to have to have more population to support them, both from a revenue perspective, but also, frankly, from a caregiving perspective. So I'll stop with that. I guess, uh, I guess, Oliver, and um, uh, let me just add a couple quick things without directly taking on um, the revenue piece or, or other pieces. But one is I think that um, we're at the point where policymakers really need to begin thinking about the art of the practical and not just the art of the theoretical. And, uh, and, and Jim made this point earlier. I mean, all of the big reforms in Medicare that I've been a part of and Chris and others on the panel have, have all um, not just been about uh, hard choices, but also been about improvements, or even if they've been about improvements, they've also been about hard choices. When uh, you know the prescription drug benefit was added to Part D, we instituted at the same time um, you know, cost sharing for higher income beneficiaries. I think that was a positive change. I think that's something that Chris mentioned that we probably ought to uh, take a look at when when you did the um, reforms in 1997, that was accompanied by, I think, um, you know, there were some bad policies, frankly, where there were some gimmicks used, but there were also a lot of good policies in pushing uh, the program more to um, uh, uh, PPS systems and, and looking at improving some of the benefits around preventive care and other things, they're going to have to go hand in hand. Congress is not going to, in a very closely divided country and what will probably be a very closely divided Congress over the next two, three, four, five years, uh, do one without the other. They're not going to make just hard choices, whether they include revenue or not, without making some of those other choices and, and improving, as Jim said, the benefit for beneficiaries. So I think um, we need to do that. I think also last point I'd make, which um, we talk about is not only would I appoint the two private trustees, but I would say I would look at even thinking about expanding the trustees to get more people involved in it, not just for from the current administration, which will change uh, at some point here in a couple of years, very likely, but uh, additional folks from private sector, maybe from the Congress to act as trustees. And I think some of these bipartisan discussions have to begin. That's really the way things happened in the, in the 90s is that there was a long lead time of serious folks thinking about these bipartisan discussions. And I commend uh, BPC and Arnold for starting to think about that process um, even today. It, all, it also included a couple government closures along the way, but yes. <laughs> It was not all. It was not all. It wasn't all peace and harmony. <laughs> well, uh, let's not put that in our recommendations for <laughs> solvency. Um, can, I, I just wanted to underscore and ask if you could comment a little bit more. Um, both Chris and Dean mentioned uh, the need to appoint trustees, uh, and Dean, you kind of talked about rethinking, um, you know, how the trustees report is used. Uh, we did have a question. Uh, in the chat related to 
something Corey mentioned about the Medicare warning, the trigger um, that uh, subsequent administrations since um, uh, the first Bush administration has, hasn't provided, a, a, or the second Bush administration hasn't done a, a plan. Are there certain things, certain process or structural things that we should be thinking about to, you know, not be in this position again of, uh, you know, waiting to act, being in this crisis to crisis? Um, how, are, how would some of those things help us um, debate these issues? Well, I'll jump in here. I mean, uh, maybe this this is going to run kind of ca contrary to to maybe some of the tone that we've had, but uh, I, I in some ways I think we need to dig the hole deeper before we start digging ourselves out. I think we need to start acknowledging that the SMI trust fund, as currently constituted, is not helping the situation. It's basically leading the policy community to kind of be complacent about that portion of Medicare and and really just focus on the HIA portion. And why is that? It's because we're relying on a trust fund construct to signal to the policy community about Medicare's health or, or non-health financially. And, you know, because SMI looks always solvent, um, you know, it just creates the impression that nothing needs to be done. And so that leads then to just focus on HI and it, so if we want a comprehensive look at Medicare and updating it and modernizing it, I think we also need to look at basically the two trust funds and what makes sense to ensure that it provides the multi-generational discipline, which is supposed to provide. That's the whole point of a trust fund. It's supposed to allow our political process to say, this is fair across generations. And right now, because you know, SMI has never got a problem going, it looks like it's okay, but it's really a big fiscal, a big fiscal issue, as I tried to outline in my health affairs post. And so I think we need to kind of, as part of maybe expanding the, the trustees who are on the serving, we need to broaden our perspective a little bit, figure out how to get the trust funds working so that they send the right political signals to our community of leaders, and then go forward with that. And I know that sounds like, well, we're we're making the problem even worse than it already is. Yeah, that's true, actually, because it is worse than it already looks, you know? And so we need to kind of figure out how to start designing solutions that are, you know, commensurate with the challenge, which is even bigger than, frankly, you know, a payroll tax rate for HI looks. I think what I, what I would add to that, um, and, I, and I agree with Jim's points, you know, in, in some ways, that was what this Medicare funding warning was supposed to do, <laughs> um, was to give policymakers a, a bigger picture, sort of red alarm um, that, you know, that, that there's something that needs to be done to ensure a more sustainable financial path forward for the Medicare program as a whole, not just you know, the Part A trust fund will be depleted in such and such a year in the future. Um, but, you know, with one exception, policymakers haven't um, responded. You know, we haven't seen, you know, the administration or, um, or Congress, you know, do much um, to respond to that warning. And so I think it does raise an important question about, you know, what red flags would actually kind of prompt uh, policymakers to respond meaningfully. Um, and I think that's a, an unanswered question, but it, but it is to me an intriguing idea to think about, you know, if these public trustees are appointed. And I do think that seems to me to be kind of the low hanging fruit in terms of the bipartisan cooperation that might be needed um, in order to make harder decisions, um, you know, about, you know, spending modifications, new revenues, in order to, uh, you know, put Medicare on more solid financial footing moving forward. If we get, you know, trustees in place, um, in addition, um, maybe they can, you know, come up with no creative ways to, you know, insert other numbers into the trustees report that, that might um, serve as, you know, an equivalent to the depletion date of the Part A trust fund um, that you know that that would kind of light a fire under Congress. That that may be the hope. So yeah, I think that's a, 
um, that is the hope for sure. And Jim, I think the 45% idea threshold was a, a good thought, of kind of an arbitrary number that people probably don't understand much about what it means. So maybe a differentiation about a definition that wakes people up is a is a good idea. And that might be something that you challenge the new trustees to develop as part of the report. You know, I mean, I, they're, they're just things that one need to kind of, you need to stir the pot a little bit. I would say this, that uh, whether it's uh, a Republican administration or Democratic administration, the usually the bigger issue is not the administrations, it's the Congress. Um, uh, the administration proposes a lot of policies on Medicare that would significantly help the Medicare program. And almost uniformly, Congress labels it dead on arrival, whichever administration it is. And so if I had to say anything, and I you know, defer to Dean, I'll hand it off to Dean to talk about this, but how does one get the Congress to think it's in their interest when they're going back and forth so often between majority and minority uh, to collaborate in that context with an administration, whomever uh, that is, Democrat or Republican, because I think that is the bigger challenge. I don't think we're want for proposals. We've got MedPAC, we've had lots of administration ideas, et cetera. It's just that Congress doesn't want to act on these things. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, uh, since Dean is closer to that and was there uh, more recently than I was, I'll let him give us the answer. <laughs> oh, you're so <laughs> kind, Chris. Well, I, I, you know, look, I, I agree with your, your last point and, and, um, and, and also um, maybe put a little more emphasis on the administration first. Look, I, I think we've all said in different ways, I think the report itself needs some process improvements. We need to, at a bare minimum, appoint the private sector folks. I would personally go farther and get Congress invested in changing the law to expand the number of folks to maybe look at the timing of the report so that it aligns more with congressional action so that it gets more people invested. But I think, Chris, you raised the, the bigger point here, which is whatever the report says, uh, however inadequate it is, um, it does have an important feature, which is at some point, Congress is going to have to do something around Part A. Uh, and B, um, there's nobody who doesn't know what's going on here. <laughs> Everybody knows what's going on here. It's just that they don't really want to address it. They'd rather talk about adding benefits or improving things um, or expanding payments. That's just the nature of uh, our, our elected government. So I think it starts with process reforms. It starts with folks taking this seriously. I noted back in the 90s, there was a relatively rare joint hearing of the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee to examine the trustees report. I don't think there's one that's happened since then. I think it also um, it continues with folks in the private sector who are who are smart, like everyone on this panel, but me, who can continue to raise the alarms and write a uh, write about it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's not just process. Folks are going to have to get down and roll up their sleeves and start to work on solutions. Um, and I, I think, you know, unfortunately, what's going to drive them ultimately is going to be this part A number, however, the things are reformed. And that's maybe not a bad thing, but they do need to start working on it now. And we need to um, try to get some folks who are serious uh, legislators um, in, invested. And Chris, the last point I'd make is I agree with you that it's largely a congressional feature. But if you think about um, the, you know, we extended the length of the trust fund a little bit, I think, in the Obama administration, in part because the president was leading on reform. We extended the trust fund back in the Clinton administration when you were there, in part because the president was both leading and following on some reforms. The, the Republicans in Congress cared about deficit reduction and the president cared about um, improvements to the program and they ultimately came together. So I think it's going to take an administration as well as a Congress that's invested. Great. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you all for those comments. Um, I, to Dean's point, I will just note that um, our SVP, Bill Hoagland, has gone through uh, multiple trustees reports, and they all have sort of boilerplate, boilerplate language on the, the sense of urgency, um, but it, it's clearly not working. Um, I want to wrap up by thanking everyone, all of our speakers, uh, for a great session. I also want to say, um, if we didn't get to your question, uh, 
this is not the end of our work on the Medicare solvency issue. We will be uh, creating an advisory uh, work group, including many of the speakers today, um, and looking at interviewing stakeholders uh, to create some recommendations uh, in advance of uh, the 2023, the next Congress. So thanks again, and look forward to more uh, on this topic from BPC.